So what are some necessities in your life? What are some necessities in your life? Food, clothing, shelter, uh, transportation, um, medicine, bacon, which is kind of like medicine. I mean, they're kind of the same thing. You know? I saw an ad this week for something, and, and the ad said this. It said that this particular item is no longer a luxury item, but it is actually a necessity for modern life. So what was this thing that is a necessity for modern life? Well, it was a screen door. Yeah, that's right. Because the ad I was reading was in the Sears, Roebuck, and Company catalog from 1897. Yeah. You know how much their most expensive screen door cost in the 1897 catalog? <laughs> this is great. $1.65. $1.65 gets you the creme de la creme of screen doors back in the day. You can't even get a Reese's pretzel big cup at Walmart for $1.65. They're $1.68. You know, you can't even get that. The reality is, is that screen doors are part of many of our lives, right? I mean, what do we think of often when we think of a screen door? For a lot of us, we think of grandma's house, right? We think of that, that screen door that, that we went into to get into her house. Because walking through that screen door meant that we realized all the bugs of summer were going to be left outside. The screen door was going to catch those bugs. But it wasn't going to catch the breeze, right? The air was going to keep coming through that door. And the outside sounds, you know, everything outside, we were still going to hear it through that screen door. Whatever was happening in the front yard across the street, we could still hear that noise drift across through the door. When I used to walk through the, the screen door at my grandmother's house, it opened up into the kitchen. And so there was always something cooking when I got at my grandmother's. And there was always a little plate of fatback on the counter right next to the stove. Man, fried fatback at my grandmother's. Man, it was almost better than bacon. But, but the reality is, is those scenes, those moments, when we think about those things, we remember everything to do with what was happening in and on the other side of those screen doors. And you've got to watch your fingers, right? Because them screen doors, they close fast, and they'll snap your fingers off. So when you consider the, the sights and the smells, all the things that, that were behind that door, the conversations, the fun, all of those things, isn't there this, this picture that there was something about the other side of that screen door that, that created this sense of safety, this sense of security, this sense of, of fun, this sense of, of love? And wouldn't it be great if every day of our lives we could have a screen door like that? A door that we can go through and, and we can still feel that breeze. And, and there's this sense that is sin and, and evil and anger and worry and stress. All the things around us keep cropping up that we could go through that door and, and those could be kind of left outside like the bugs. They could get caught in the door and they, they wouldn't come in with us. Wouldn't it be nice if, if there was a door like that that would help us escape all the time? Escape so that we would feel this sense of confidence that we would feel that, that it is possible for it to be well with our soul. We continue our series, Doors, today, where we've been considering some of the most defining doors in life. And as you might imagine, today's message is going to be screen doors. And we're going to be looking at Galatians chapter 1, Paul's letter to the churches in Galatia. And we will begin with verse 1. Galatians 1, verse 1. Listen as Paul begins his letter, and he writes... Paul, an apostle not sent from men nor through human agency, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead. Now, normally Paul would begin his letters with something like, hey, I, I thank my God for you, or, you know, we give thanks to God for you. I remember you in all of my prayers. You know, always, always something kind of nice and cordial and positive, but this time he gets straight to the point. I told y'all before my, my love for politics and, and in the movie The American President there's a, a scene that has particular punch. Uh, Michael Douglas plays the role of President Andrew Shepard uh, and there's a, a scene where he's given a press conference. And the reason he's given this press conference is because his, his political rival, Bob Rumson, played by Richard Dreyfus, has been making some accusations against him. 
And every time Bob Rumson closed one of his speeches, whether he was out speaking or he was on a talk show or whatever, he would always end with the same sentence. He would say, I'm Bob Rumson and I'm running for president. It was like a big punch. So in this press conference, President Shepard is responding to the accusations, and this is how he ends his speech. This is a time for serious men, Bob, and your 15 minutes of fame are up. My name's Andrew Shepard, and I am the president. I mean, it was just, you know, it was a punch. You know, I'm not running for it. I am the president. This is the similar scene that we have with Paul. Paul is beginning his letter with a gracious declaration, I am Paul, and I am an apostle. Now, now why would he do that? Why was that even necessary? Was he just being politically or religiously arrogant? No. Let me ask you a question. Do you have any rivals in your life right now? Do you have any enemies? Do you have someone who's making your life very difficult right now? Well, Paul had some rivals, and, and his rivals were doing everything they could to disrupt his life. Specifically, they were going around telling everybody, hey, Paul, he's, he's not really an apostle. And a lot of people would believe that because part and parcel, one of the things that is, is involved with being an apostle of Jesus Christ is that you were with Jesus when he was resurrected. So you were around Jesus right after he had been risen from the dead. So Paul didn't have that. And so what his rivals were saying was, oh, Paul's not an apostle. He wasn't there. He's a persecutor of Christians. The only people that are saying he's an apostle is that little entourage that follows him around, but, but he has no official, official apostleship. He's not really an apostle. And they were going beyond that too. Paul's rivals were saying, hey, look, if you really want to be right with God, if you want things to be right with God, if you want to make it to heaven, what you really need to do is follow our church rules. Because if you'll follow our church rules, that'll make everything good. You'll get to go to heaven. You'll be riding on the streets of gold in your own gold-plated golf cart. But Paul wasn't teaching that. Paul was teaching something completely different. And that's why his rival said, hey, don't listen to Paul. Don't listen to what he's teaching. He's, he's not really an apostle. So Paul's beginning this letter trying to respond to his rivals. And he doesn't begin by saying, look, I'm writing to you because I was ordained by the church. He doesn't begin by saying, look, I'm, I'm writing to you because I have my PhD in theology. He doesn't begin by saying, look, I, I've been a pastor, an elder, a, a deacon in the church for many years. That's why I'm writing to you. None of those are the reasons that he's writing. Paul says, look, as I begin this letter, I'm writing to you because I'm an apostle of Jesus Christ. I am a messenger, a direct messenger, directly appointed by the one true God. So how did Paul become an apostle? If he wasn't there at the resurrection, how did he become an apostle? Well, Paul says, through Jesus Christ. And he's not saying through Jesus Christ like it was some kind of, you know, Facebook marketplace transaction. Okay, no, oh, I, I got my apostleship through Jesus, you know. No, he's, he's giving it some language. He, he said that it was through Jesus who God had raised from the dead. So, yes, it is true. Paul was not there. He wasn't hanging out with the others right after Jesus had been risen from the dead. And Paul didn't receive an official certificate framed from the church saying that he was an apostle. But he wants there to be no mistake that one day on a particular road on the way to Damascus, that it was the bodily resurrected Jesus Christ that invaded his world and brought him grace. Paul wants to be clear that he's not overly defending himself, He's not trying to bring unnecessary attention to himself. He's just passionately making the point, I did not send myself to you. I was sent to you by Jesus. Paul was a well-known, well-educated, well-respected, well-feared political leader and religious leader. People knew him. He was important. And he's walking down this road one day, and all of a sudden, he's on his knees. One moment he can see, the next moment he can't see. 
And in his blindness, suddenly he began to find sight, not from his eyes, but in his heart. So what Paul is doing and why Paul is writing has nothing to do with personal glory. This is not professional ambition that has moved him to write this letter. This is not some kind of religious Ponzi scheme that he's put together to try to gain some money. No, the reason Paul's writing this letter is from compulsion. One day on a particular road, sometime between 33 and 36 A.D., Jesus, the risen Jesus, appeared to Paul and brought him salvation, brought him peace, brought him hope, brought him joy. And Paul was compelled. He was compelled to do everything he could to make the most of Jesus that he could with his life. Paul's an apostle because Jesus made him an apostle. And he makes it clear here i want you to know i am writing to you i am speaking to you because jesus directly sent me the risen jesus invaded my life with grace and he made me an apostle so what does this apostle have to say look at verse three he begins with this grace to Now, this isn't a a catchy phrase uh, of greeting. No, this is a passionate blessing. This is an eager desire. There's a big difference between me saying, you know, Merry Christmas to the guy at the eggnog food truck and and me standing in in front of a, a group of people, my family, my friends before God at my wedding and saying, I do. They're, they're different phrases. They're different statements. And this isn't a a wedding vow when Paul says grace to you, but it's more than just a, hey, have a good day, or hey, I'll put another shrimp on the barbie. There's more to this. It's this eager desire for whoever's reading and whoever's listening to have grace. Grace, by definition, is unmerited favor from God. But it's so much more than a definition. The grace of God is kind of like the breeze coming through that screen door. It's it's the wind over your soul. It's, It's the one ultimate air that your soul needs to truly be alive, to truly be free. There's common grace. All of us are experiencing that right now, meaning that we're we're breathing. So we're receiving the common grace of God. Even if you don't believe in God, if you're breathing right now, you're receiving the common grace of God because it's only by grace that you're breathing. But then there's the unique grace of the gospel. And that's what Paul's about to, to unpack a little bit here. And, and it's, it's exactly why he was being attacked. See, his rivals were saying that, that salvation was found in religious feelings alone, through living good and morally alone, in church membership alone. But Paul was teaching that salvation was by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. That's his message of grace. And what does he say about that grace? Continuing in verse 3. Grace to you and peace from God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins. This is how we know what true grace is. This is how we know what true love is. This is how we know what true freedom is. Jesus of Nazareth, the Son of God, gave himself for my sin, gave himself for your sin. Jesus gave himself up, gave himself over for our sin. Jesus didn't just donate to a charity. He didn't just volunteer at a homeless shelter. He didn't just join a church. Jesus was beaten and he was bruised and he was tortured. He was sentenced to death. He was brutally executed outside of Jerusalem and in a way that was the most cruel and most shameful way a person could die. But he didn't mean to. It 
It just, it just kind of happened to him. It was just kind of accidental. He kind of fell into it. And then once the church council got involved, and, and then once the Roman government got involved, he was, he was just kind of stuck and he couldn't get out of it. No, <laughs> none of that's true. No, Jesus did it on purpose. Jesus very much meant to. Before the foundations of the world, this was the plan. One day Jesus was teaching a crowd of people and he said this in John chapter 10, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. No one has taken my life away from me, but I lay it down on my own. I have authority to lay it down and I have authority to take it back. All right, just so you know, there will not be a moment this week that I go see Dr. Shalkham, my doctor, and say, hey, Dr. Shalkham, I want you to know, no matter what your diagnosis is today, I have authority to lay my life down and I got authority to take it back. Because I don't, and you don't. Jesus did and does. See, every moment almost that Jesus spoke was, was kind of like a mic drop. And here in this moment, Jesus is clearly letting us know that his life was not taken. He gave his life. His life was given. And when he was taken, when he was beaten, when he was tortured, when he was sentenced to death, when he stood in front of Pilate, the Roman leader, when he was taken outside of Jerusalem and, and brutally executed, there was nothing going through Jesus' mind that sounded like this. Well, I mean, I gave it a good shot. Yeah, I mean, I, I think maybe I made the world a little bit of a better place. No, those, those weren't the thoughts that would have been in the mind of the Son of God. Simon Peter was speaking to a crowd of probably thousands of people. And in that moment, he said, that Jesus was raised from the dead because death could not hold him. The power of death could not hold him. The letter to the Hebrews, it says that Jesus has the power of an indestructible life. His, his life can't be destroyed. So Jesus, the Son of God, he loved you and he gave himself over for you. He gave himself up for me and for you. And he did that he was brutally executed so that we would not have to die in our sin and therefore experience death and separation from God forever. And he did that and he was gloriously raised from the dead so that the salvation that he is offering to every one of us right now would be undeniably true because of his resurrection. It wasn't just a fairy tale. He was raised from the grave to prove that all of it was true and he did it voluntarily. He laid his life down and by the power of God in him, he raised his life again. He gave himself over, fully aware that he would be bringing his life back up again. That is grace. When Paul says grace to you, it's not just a, hey, how are you, how you doing? It is this eager desire that the indestructible power of Jesus Christ would be blowing and flowing through your soul. That kind of grace, it matters right now. That kind of grace matters tomorrow at 1230. That kind of grace matters Tuesday at 2 o'clock. That kind of grace matters Friday night and, and every other day of the rest of your life. This grace from Jesus Christ, this grace through Jesus Christ, it matters all the time. John Piper said this about Jesus giving himself up for our sins. For 20 centuries, the world has given it their best shot in vain. They can't bury him they can't hold him in. They can't silence him or limit him. Jesus is alive and utterly free to go and come wherever he pleases. And then he says this, trust him and go with him no matter what because you cannot lose in the end. 
you cannot lose. Dear Christian, no matter what happens to you this afternoon, no matter what happens to you tomorrow, no matter what happens to you next week, no matter what happens to you 10 years from now, no matter what personal tragedy you may experience in your family, no matter what tragedy you may experience with your career, no matter what happens in the world from the White House to the State House to the Church House to your house, no matter what, in Christ you cannot lose. You are connected to the power of an indestructible life. Not as a fairy tale, he's already proven it. Death cannot hold Jesus. So if you're connected to Jesus, you can't lose. That is grace. When Paul says grace to you, it's, it's not just a greeting. He's saying this is indestructible life that that's what i desire for you grace is jesus gave himself over for our sins that is grace that is grace to you and why did he do it why did jesus give himself over for our sins listen to verse four so that he might rescue us from this present evil age listen family and friends government politics law uh, the church uh, medicine education all those things are are great and they all have their place of importance and look sitting at grandma's house behind that screen door enjoying the breeze having a piece of pie or or some fat back look that's that's fantastic that's that's super but your family and your friends and your education and the government and the church and medicine cannot save you from evil. And as good as grandma's pie is, it, it can't save you from evil. We live in a world that is evil. And the world is, has always been evil. It's just this is our evil now. So we live in this time that is evil and and what Paul says is, look, only Jesus can ultimately deliver you from evil. Jesus wasn't just a good example to us. Jesus is our atonement. That means he's the payment for the penalty of sin. And that may sound strange and, and even barbaric to us in modern times. But the reality is, Jesus took his own blood and he used his blood to purchase the benefits of grace. And the benefits of grace are, are namely that you can be right with God, that you can step into eternity after you breathe your last with, with hope and joy and anticipation and excitement, and you can enjoy the greatness of God forever. You see, the gospel, it's a rescue. I need to be rescued. You need to be rescued. We need to be rescued from sin and hell and death. We, we need to be rescued from all of the things that will stress us out this week. We need to be rescued from, from all the hard and difficult things that we'll face this week and even the things we've faced this past week. We need to be rescued from evil. We need to be rescued from this temporary world that is full of evil. We need to be rescued from this temporary world that will not always exist. And I'm not an apostle. I'm just a sinner saved by grace. But I have been called to do all that I can to proclaim the excellencies of Christ. And so I would graciously say, based on the whole of the Bible and the reality of creation and the very existence of your breath, the grace of God says over and over in a lot of different ways that if you leave this world without Christ you will never be rescued from evil. You will actually be transferred into an evil age of darkness that will never end. So receive the rescue. The gospel is rescue, and the rescuer is Jesus Christ. 
His blood was the payment that he delivered so that you might be rescued from this evil age and you might be rescued forever. And only Jesus can do that. That doesn't mean we don't need to vote. It doesn't mean we don't need laws. It doesn't mean that we don't need to support our government and we don't need education and we don't need jobs and and we don't need all the things that we have to function in life. But let us not be fools and think that if the right person is in the White House that we'll be delivered from evil. No. Or that if the right person is in the pulpit that we'll be delivered from evil. No. The only way we can be delivered from evil is Jesus Christ. His life and only His life is indestructible and that is grace. That's the grace to you that Paul is giving. He's he's not just saying, hey and howdy. He's saying, oh, this indestructible life, it can be ours and I so long for it to be yours. That's how he begins his letter. And how do you think he ends it? Listen to Galatians 6, 18. This is the last sentence of his whole book. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ Be with your spirit, brothers and sisters. Amen. So he begins with grace and he ends with grace, but the wording is just a little bit different. At the beginning, he says grace to you. Hey, I want you to have grace right now. I'm getting ready to give you these fantastic words about the indestructible life of Jesus. So I I want you to have this grace right now, right now, right now. And then at the end, he says grace be with you. So it's like, I want want you to have grace right now and then I want you to have it later it's it's a flow of grace like like the flow of air through a screen door it's this back and forth of God's grace I want you to have it now and I want you to have it later see just like us Paul had rivals He, he had enemies he had people that made his life really difficult I heard a a very uh, interesting quote this week and I'm, I'm going to butcher it, but I'll, I'll put it together best I can. Um, and, and if my math is right, I think this is from a, 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 a minister across the, across the big pond. Do not ever measure your life based on the words of joyless people. It's very simple, but I was like, oh. Don't ever measure your life based on the words of joyless Now, if I were to bring that into our world as Christians, if someone does not have joy in Christ in the church or outside of the church, don't measure your life by what they say. Don't measure your life by their opinion. Don't measure your life by their complaints, their criticisms, or anything else. Doesn't mean we can ignore everything that's ever said, but don't measure your life by people who have no joy in Christ. Paul didn't do it. He he kept focusing on the grace of Jesus Christ. So just like us, Paul had enemies, he had rivals, he had people that made his life difficult. Just like us, Paul lived in a time where people argued about politics and they argued about religion and they argued about medicine and they argued about just about everything else they could possibly argue about. And just like us, Paul lived in evil days. Oh, this this time that Paul lived, it it was an evil, evil time. So what did he do? How how did Paul deal with with all the the evil days around him? How did he deal with with living in in a difficult and evil world? Well, this is what he did. He kept escaping that world by walking in and out of the screen door of the gospel. And every time he went through that door, he would feel the breeze of the gospel. And it would remind him that Jesus loved him, that Jesus gave himself up for him. And if that was true, that he could turn to Jesus and he could go with Jesus no matter what, because with Jesus, he knew that he could not lose. Dear Christian, with Jesus, this this is no fairy tale. This isn't the catchy phrase at the end of a sermon. 
because of his crucifixion, because of his resurrection, because of his ascension, because of his coming return, because of his indestructible life in Christ, you cannot lose. You cannot lose. Therefore, I with Paul and for our church say to you because of that truth, grace to you and grace be with you.